2 Timothy chapter 4. As you're turning there, let me just warn you. Today's message is going to be a little different in that, yes, it will be instruction. Yes, it will be exposition. I hope it will be inspirational, but it will also be informational because there are certain things I believe we all need to be aware of. You'll see what I mean when we get through it, but 2 Timothy chapter 4, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we ask that you will give us your wisdom and discernment uh, to understand the days in which we live, to be able to not only know our times, but to be able to meet the need, the questions, the wranglings that people have, and to be able to speak the truth clearly. Lord, prepare us, equip us, and use us. Also, Lord, I just have a special prayer for families, college-age kids, people, Lord, that are dealing with ideas and philosophies in this world that are so different from how they were raised. We pray, Lord, that you would give strength and clarity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, 26 years ago, in 1998, a movie hit the box office called The Truman Show. Anybody remember The Truman Show? Okay, The Truman Show starred Jim Carrey. He played the main character named Truman. And Truman was adopted at birth by a TV studio and he was placed in a literal bubble of a town. He thought it was just the regular world that everybody else uh, was living in, but it was basically a stage set. There were cameras everywhere. Um, it recorded his every move as he grew up in this imaginary world. All of it was unbeknownst to him until certain clues emerged where he thought, Maybe this isn't reality. Maybe this is something else. Well, about halfway through uh, the film, as he discovers that the sets and the people um, are imaginary, uh, he, he sort of gets the idea and he understands that he is the most popular actor that the world is watching. And about halfway through the show, the show's creator named Kristoff played by Ed Harris, is asked this question by a reporter. The reporter says, why has Truman never discovered the true nature of his world until now? And the response was pretty amazing. Ed Harris, Kristoff said, we accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. We accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. In other words, this is his truth. This is Truman's truth. Of course, the whole plot of the movie is it's not his truth. I mean, it might be his truth, but he discovers his truth is not the truth. And the truth is very different. About a decade ago, I first heard this little phrase that we're addressing today, speak your truth. It was in a context of a conversation where somebody said, well, that's your truth. I'm speaking my truth. And I remember being like taken aback by that because I didn't know that there was a difference between a person's truth and the actual truth. I mean, since when do you get to personalize it? And uh, I was taken aback because I grew up with a framework of absolute truth. I grew up believing that something is either true or it is false. I had in my family and in my education a framework of basic logic. You know, A must always be A, it can never be non-A. In other words, two plus two equals four. That's not my truth, that's the truth. Smoking is hazardous to your health. That's not my truth. That happens to be the truth. 
There are only two genders, not 42 genders. That's not my truth. That is the truth. Now, every pastor gets asked, self-included, from time to time by parents, why is it when I send my kids to college, they come back thinking completely different than how we sent them? This is not who we are. This is not what we train them to be. Why is it that they think so radically different? And uh, the answer is not because now they're enlightened necessarily. The answer is because the basis of truth has been moved and you didn't know it. Let me explain that. The basis of truth has been moved from something that is objective, that is outside of us, to something that is subjective inside of us. It's how you feel about it. That has been the shift. You see, there was a time in our society when there was a moral consensus, a shared value system. Right was right, wrong was wrong, good was good, evil was evil, truth and error were different. But what has happened is over the years, over the centuries really, there has been a rise of humanism that has changed all of that. When I use the term humanism, I'll define it as simply this. It's the idea that man is the center of all things, not God. And that goes all the way back to a Greek philosopher named Protagoras who said, man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. This phrase, speak your truth, when you drill down, has very little or nothing at all to do with actual truth. What it really means when you strip it all away is simply this, say what you feel, express your opinion, state your perspective. In other words, say it as you see it. That's all it means. But when you add the word truth to it, you are now elevating it a little bit. You are making it sound so much more noble when you say, well, that's my truth as opposed to your truth. And in such a world as ours, objective truth statements are now seen as narrow-minded, bigoted, and arrogant. And so, here we are, Proclaiming what Jesus said about himself, I am the way, the truth, the life. And when you make that statement, or people read that statement, to modern ears that sounds abrasive, that sounds confrontational. I'm going to show you how we got there briefly in a minute. For the meantime, I've had you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. You should probably know that 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. It is, you might say, his last will and testament. He writes to young Timothy, who's not so young anymore. He has grown up under Paul. He's been mentored by Paul. He has been the apostle's protege. When Paul writes this letter, he knows he's going to die very shortly. He says so in this letter. And when you know your time is short, you usually talk about what matters most. And what is uppermost in Paul's mind as he is facing his own mortality, it is inevitable. What concerns him the most is people who would be falling away from the truth. It's smattered throughout the entire letter. I'll spare you from reading it all. But throughout the letter, he expresses this concern that there is deviation going on, falling away, departure from the faith because of deception. That brings us to our text, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, 
they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from, notice, the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. In those five verses, we basically have three instructions regarding the truth, and they're very simple. We should know the truth, we should guard the truth, we should speak the truth. First of all, we should know the truth. There are some important phrases I want to draw your attention to. In fact, if you don't mind circling, writing in your Bible with a pen or a pencil, you may want to circle these words or connect them with a line. Uh, notice in verse 2 the phrase, the word. Preach the word. And then also, at the end of that second verse, the word teaching. And then would you notice in verse 4 the phrase, the truth, and then in verse 5, your ministry. All those words and phrases are connected. They essentially mean the same thing. In other words, what Paul is saying is your ministry, Timothy, is to teach people the word which is sound doctrine. And when he says preach the word, he means preach the scripture, the word of God. Lest you think I'm reading that into it, I want to take you back for the sake of context, if you don't mind, even if you do mind, go back to chapter 3, look at verse 14, where Paul says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then he launches into our text. I charge you, therefore, before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, preach the word. So, all those are connected. Here's a little, here's a little uh, diagram. Word equals scripture equals doctrine equals truth. We should know that. We should know the truth. Knowing the truth is on Paul's mind so much that he repeats this 11 times in this letter. We should know the truth. Why? Well, we are primarily people of truth. That sort of is our calling card. We are proclaiming the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we believe, I believe, I hope you do as well, that our source of truth is the scripture, the word of God, the teaching, the sound doctrine. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel referred to the Bible as the scripture of truth. You want to know why? It's the only book in the world that'll tell you the truth about God, about you, about your condition, and about what you knew, need to do to fix that. It'll tell you the truth. So, rather than a humanistic foundation, man is the center of all things, the measure of all things, ours is a theistic foundation. That's a different worldview. God is the measure of all things. Now, look at a phrase uh, in verse 3. Look at that phrase, sound doctrine. I am aware that whenever I speak the word doctrine, um, that will fall on different ears different ways. And for some of you, that is a word that just sounds way too stiff. I know that because I hear the way some Christians talk about doctrine almost apologetically. I've told you before, I feel sorry for certain words. This is one of them. Yeah, I listen to Christians say, well, I don't want to make this about doctrine. First of all, before you say that, you need to know what the word doctrine actually means. It means good teaching, wholesome, solid instruction. So how ridiculous does it sound when you say, I don't want to make this about good, wholesome, solid teaching. Really, you don't? 
because I do. That's what doctrine is. I've told you before that um, many people treat the scripture like they treat the owner's manual in their vehicle. They know it's there. They're not going to go home and read it. But when something breaks in the car, they will open it and feverishly look through it to find how they can fix the problem. A lot of people neglect the manual of truth in favor for their own personal truth. But doctrine is important. In um, Acts chapter 2, remember what was on the church's priority list? They gave themselves steadfastly to the apostles' doctrine, number one. 1 Timothy chapter 4, until I come, give attention to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. To Titus, very similar, teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. I'll never forget reading these words from one of my favorite authors, James Boyce, years ago. He said, we do not have a strong church today, nor do we have many strong Christians And this can be traced back to an acute lack of sound spiritual knowledge. You see, there are certain things you need to know. You need to know the truth. On four different occasions, Jesus said to his detractors, religious people, have you not read? He was referring to their Bible. Don't you read the very book you claim is your source for authority? Have you not read? And I wonder if Jesus were here and asked us that question, have you not read? How would we honestly answer that? Some of us would have to say, well, actually, no, I haven't. Because 11% of Americans read the Bible. 4% of Americans have a biblical worldview. Do you realize what that means? It means 96% of Americans would basically agree with the idea, speak your truth. Well, it gets worse because that's just Americans in general, and I know you could say, yeah, but we're Christian Americans. We're very different. Well, according to George Barna, two in five evangelicals say it doesn't matter what religious faith you follow. So if I were to get five people, and I won't point to them in a, in a row somewhere in church, if I took five of them, two of them would say, it didn't matter what you believe in. And he continues, one third of evangelicals say we all pray to the same God and faith in Jesus Christ is not necessary. So we should know the truth. We should know the truth. Second, we should guard the truth. Verse 3 tells you why. For the time will come. And I wonder if it hasn't come already. For the time will come when they will not endure good, wholesome, solid, sound teaching. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will be, they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I'd like to read that to you in a paraphrase version called The Message by Eugene Peterson. He translates it this way. There will be times, the times will come when people will, ha- will have no stomach for solid teaching, but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. I wonder how many of you realize there's a crisis of truth today. And when I say a crisis of truth, what I mean is most people are cynical when it comes to truth and believe truth cannot be known. Like Pontius Pilate, even 2,000 years ago, who in the presence of Jesus said, what is truth? That's the prevailing thought today. The prevailing thinking today is that No one, no one can legitimately claim to have a corner on the market when it comes to truth. They insist there is no absolute truth. Have you ever had somebody say that to you? There is no absolute truth. 
Now, first of all, whenever you hear somebody say there is no absolute truth, they just made a self-contradictory statement because they just stated an absolute. But I digress. (laughs) Most people think truth is personal, individual, and variable. That it is subjective from within, not objective from without. Now, why is that? How did we get to that point? I want to give you now a brief thumbnail sketch, a little brief historical journey through the weird world of philosophy. And I say weird. I took so many philosophy courses for a master's degree years ago. And I'll tell you what, if you want to be confused, I've discovered that human philosophers for thousands of years have tried to explain truth decidedly unsuccessfully. You see, the ancients, and I go way back, just simply assumed the validity of truth and human knowledge. But around 500 BC, these three guys popped up, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. They started dealing with the problem of how do we discover what is true? And they set forth several explanations of how truth is conveyed to the mind. I'm not going to go through their streams of thought. I'll just lump them all together. But since then, for the next, oh, couple thousand years, philosophers presupposed that knowledge was conveyed through nature, that truth is related to reality. And it centers around the way the world actually is. But in the 1600s, and I'm only selecting a few major philosophical streams. In the 1600s, this guy came, Rene Descartes. He was a French philosopher, and he wrestled with the question, how do we get knowledge? Descartes was a rationalist. That is, truth is known by reason. So he began with a few fundamental truths. In fact, he believed that all people are born with a few imbued fundamental truths. And then using logical deductions, he built a more sophisticated structure of knowledge. Rene Descartes was the father of epistemology. And I know you're thinking, really, really? You gotta say epistemology in church? Shouldn't you be telling us a scripture verse or something? But let me tell you what it, what it is, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. And in academic circles, it's the fair of the day. It's the theory of knowledge. It is how we know what we know. Um, How do you have a justifiable belief in anything? That's epistemology. By the way, Rene Descartes was the one who said, I think, therefore I am. See, I knew you knew who he was. I think, therefore, I am. That is, he established his own existence and built up from there to prove other facts. So that was rationalism. But a little bit after him, this guy shows up, John Locke. He was sort of a contemporary, born a little bit after Descartes. He read Rene Descartes' work, and he disagreed with him. And what he said is that the mind is really a blank slate. There are no imbued facts that we are born with. Uh, We are informed only by experience. So he developed not rationalism, but what is called empiricism, that we get knowledge purely through the senses, not because of reason. John Locke said, and I quote, there is no knowledge innate to the mind. All of our ideas come from one of two sources, experience or natural faculties, close quote. But then in the 1700s, a German philosopher showed up by the name of Immanuel Kant. And his parents said, you should do philosophy. He said, I can't. No, I, I, I can't resist. I got to keep your attention, basically, in, in this kind of stuff. So this is what he said. He said, the views of both Descartes and Locke are wrong and must be discarded. Neither logic nor experience are sufficient. You need both. So neither rationalism nor empiricism can account for knowledge. It is rather a combination of both of those. 
Okay, so far, so good. Till he dies. And then when he dies and other people are born in the late 1700s, early 1800s, Hegel shows up. Another German philosopher, uh, listen to his name, uh, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. And uh, he said, Immanuel Kant's view is inadequate. Listen to what he said. You're starting to kind of figure out how we're getting to where we have today. He said, truth is fluid. Truth is fluid. Reality is not a constant. Truth evolves as societies change. And his philosophy is what opened the door for people like Friedrich Nietzsche with his existentialism, Karl Marx and his theory of class division, et cetera, et cetera. Here's what I want to show you. All these elaborate philosophies and epistemologies were set forth only to be debunked and then deconstructed by the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. These philosophies have not stopped. They continue in every generation. But what you need to be aware of, and the reason I'm doing this, is there has been in our societies, our culture, a seismic shift. You felt it, you knew it, but you didn't know why. I want to show you why. I'll tell you about the seismic shift. The shift has been from modernism to what is called postmodernism, and they are vastly different. Modernism, postmodernism, and now there's even something called meta modernism. So, modernism basically believes that truth does exist and can be verified scientifically. In other words, two plus two equals four. Boys are boys, girls are girls, etc. Modernism. But postmodernism, since like the 1980s, is vastly different. It dismisses anything as being certain or absolute. So in postmodernism, nothing is certain, and a thoughtful person will never speak about anything with much conviction at all. Because if he speaks about anything with conviction and certitude, it is seen as arrogant, naive, and ignorant. In other words, everyone is entitled to his own truth. There are absolutely no absolutes. Welcome to postmodernism. But, as I said, lately there's this thing called metamodernism. And uh, I'm not going to get into lengthy detail. I'll just put it this way. Metamodernism is more postmodern than even postmodernism. So it's all about ambiguity. It's all about deconstruction and reconstruction of commonly held ideas. Here's some characteristics. It's the rejection of truth in plain propositional terms. You know about propositional truth. Propositional truth is clear, logical, it must be affirmed or denied. Postmodernism, metamodernism cannot endure that. They can't endure that kind of clarity. It must be about the individual, not about what we all know to be true, but about the individual. So, Get this, uncertainty is the new truth. Isn't that wonderful? Uncertainty is the new truth. Skepticism and doubt reign supreme. Right and wrong don't exist. What matters most, as I said, is how you feel. What is it that creates all this? Well, we're told in verse 3, the time will come and they will not endure good, sound, solid, teaching, doctrine, but according to their own desires, what they feel inside, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth. Itching ears refers to itching for novelty. It describes people who seek out opinions and teachings that support their own decisions and lifestyle. So the person who curates his, own, curates his own social media and he will not listen to any voices except the voice that agrees and affirms him. 
So back to our text. They will not endure sound doctrine, but heap up for themselves teachers. They have itching ears. The message says spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. Now, the reason I took you through that brief thumbnail sketch of philosophy, I know it can seem tedious to some of us, but you can't guard the truth unless you understand what you are guarding it from and how we came to believe what society now believes. So we should know the truth. We should guard the truth. There's a third instruction here. We should, we as believers should, we as Christians should speak the truth. Verse 2, preach the word. Now, if the phrase, the truth is controversial, then preaching is also very controversial. Don't preach at me. Preach the word. Preach the word. Speak the truth. Speak the word. And then go down to verse 5. Let me take you there. After saying, this is what's going to happen, people are going to turn away from the truth. But you, Timothy, but you, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions because they're going to come. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. In contrast to those who neglect the truth, Timothy, you, hold to the truth. Timothy, you, be shaped by the truth. Timothy, you, speak the truth. Feed on the truth. Feed others the truth. Now, I want to sort of reinforce this a little bit, so let me take you down a few verses. Look at verse 6. Paul says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. That's an Old Testament way of saying I'm about to kick the bucket. Because he says this, and the time of my departure is at hand. I'm about to die. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not only me, but all, also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul uses himself finally as an example of somebody who held to the truth, was faithful to the truth, fulfilled and finished his task. Now, this is our calling. Our calling is to know the truth, guard the truth, live the truth, speak the truth. Paul knew when he wrote this, as he's about to die, he knew what Timothy is facing. Timothy is surrounded by all sorts of very smart, sophisticated Greek, Greco-Roman orators and philosophers who were twisting truth. And he knew also that because they were twisting truth, many people in Timothy's congregation would be turning away from the truth. So he gives the antidote. Don't be ashamed. Preach the word. Don't shrink back. Speak the truth. That's the antidote. The antidote to atheistic modernism, the antidote to postmodernism and metamodernism is as simple as preach the word. D.L. Moody, a fine preacher, said, the best way to show that a stick is crooked is not to argue about it or spend time denouncing it, but to lay a straight stick alongside of it. Here's the straight stick. People give you their shtick, put the straight stick Next to it, the Bible. Now, this needs to be said. Because some of you are still thinking, well, if I speak the truth, I understand that people are going to hear that and they're going to get offended by it. It's going to hurt their feelings. Uh, They're going to turn off to me. This is what I want you to know. Love and truth are not enemies. In fact, did you know that one of the most loving things you could ever do is to tell people the truth? Now, do it in a nice way. The Bible says we should speak the truth in love. But I got to tell you something. No matter how nicely you go about telling people the truth and laying down the straight stick, understand that at some level, 
Not everybody's going to listen with bated breath. Some are going to be offended greatly, call you narrow-minded, bigoted, belligerent, etc., etc., etc. But I think of it this way. It is better to tell the truth and be thought hateful than to whisper lies and be thought loving and compassionate. It's not loving and compassionate to lie to people. It's more loving to tell them the truth. So let me sum it all up now. The idea of your truth versus the truth is the core idea of philosophical absurdism. It implies there is no objective reality, there is no shared truth, and it thereby makes life meaningless. How can you have meaningful dialogue? How can you have uh, any kind of conversation or agreement unless you have an agreement on basic facts of reality? How are you going to teach math or science or history unless you have a common ground on what truth is? Truth doesn't require a possessive pronoun in front of it. My truth, your truth, our truth, their truth. If it has a possessive pronoun in front of it, chances are it's not truth. And what I'm saying is that if you're going to use that terminology, would you just please become more honest about it and simply say, here's my opinion. Here's my thought on that. Finally, my brethren, to quote Paul, Christianity rests upon truth. What I mean by truth is not an abstract concept of truth. I'm talking about objective truth, that certain things happened at a certain place in history, notably the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Moreover, the one we follow and believe in who died for us made himself a very unique truth claim when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And also a promise when he said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you want to be free, if you want to experience freedom, I wouldn't suggest you take a philosophy course you will become confused. It's okay to study it, but you need bearings if you're going to study it. You need to be moored if you're going to study it. You want freedom, you come to Christ. Because truth, we discover, is a person. I am the truth. And millions of people throughout history who have called upon his name in every culture and every generation with different languages, different backgrounds, have all had the same experience of a changed life and discovered he's truth. And he gives a source of truth, his word. Father, thank you for the truth of the word of God. Thank you that we don't have to tread water in a sea of confusion that is secular humanism. Thank you, Lord, that we have more than a person who made a truth claim. He has proved himself to be true as millions of lives for the last 2,000 years have been totally, radically changed. From peasants to kings. From students to intellectual professors. From scientists to sociologists. From doctors to lawyers. And everybody in between, people all over the world have been objectively changed by truth. The truth of Christ. Lord, help us in this world not only to know and to guard and to speak, but to be able to do so with effect, with impact, with with coherence, Lord, that, that will set the dialogue in favor of people opening up their hearts and minds to the possibility that there's not only a God who loves them, but who is willing to, by truth, with truth, set them free. Now, as we close this service, I often like to give an invitation to those people who are 
ready and willing to make a choice for Christ? It is my prayer that if you're a believer, your roots would go down and be so solid you would be unshakable. My prayer for those of you who don't yet know Christ is that you would be willing to leave the confusing world that you are living in and you know you're living in it and come to the one who with absolute clarity and dignity said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and see if it's not so. You've tried everything else to no effect. You've tried to find satisfaction by drinking from so many different wells. Your soul is parched. Give your life to Christ. See if he won't change you completely. Of course, that is a decision only you can make, and I'm inviting you to make it. If you've never really truly given your life to Christ or if you need to come back to him because you've wandered from him and you need a recommitment, I want to give you that opportunity. You don't have to do it, but I'm saying you should do it. It's the most important thing you could ever do. And I'm going to give you a simple opportunity. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'm going to keep my eyes open. And if you're willing to say today, At this moment, Skip, today, I am willing and ready to surrender my life to Christ. I'm going to turn to him. I want to ask him to forgive me. I want to give you the opportunity to raise your hand in the air. I'll notice your hand. I'll pray for you as we close this service. But I'd like you to raise your hand up. You're saying, Skip, yeah, that's me. I, I need to know him. I need to be forgiven. I need a, a, a second start in life. Just slip your hand up in the air. By raising your hand, you're just saying, I acknowledge that, God bless you, and you in the middle. Raise it up high enough just so I can see it. Thank you, and in the back, yep. I see your hand there. I know some of you are skeptical and you're thinking, well, how do I know this will really work? You never will until you do it. But think about what you have to gain and what you have to lose. You have absolutely nothing to lose. You have absolutely, if this is true, everything to gain. Who else? Father, thank you for those who have acknowledged by the raising of the hand. Behind that hand is a life, a heart, ambitions, plans, hopes, and dreams. Lord, I pray that as each person who raised the hand surrenders their life to you, that you would confirm in their own experience, in their own being, their own heart, the importance of this choice and that Jesus is indeed the truth. It's more than truth just for them. He is the truth for anyone who will acknowledge. So if you raise your hand right where you are, just, just say this simple prayer. Let me give you language for that. Just say, Lord, I give you my life. Say that to him right now. Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. Please forgive me. I believe in Jesus. I trust him. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again. I turn from my sin. And I turn my life to Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Give me your help to live a life for you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Hey, thanks for tuning in to this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We've got a great one for you today as we look at this topic of truth in a morally relativistic culture. And we see three things today. We need to know the truth. We need to guard the truth. And we need to speak the truth. And we hope this message encourages you. If it does, if the ministry of Calvary Church is an encouragement to you, we would love to hear your story. You can email us, my story at calvaryabq.org. We would love to hear from you. And also, if this ministry is an encouragement to you and you'd like to give today to help support this ministry financially, you can give in the top corner of our website or if you're watching on YouTube at our homepage, there should be a link there that you can click. But we hope you enjoy it. We hope to hear your story.